1 Kings chapter 17. And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, The Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand. There is, There shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. And then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Get away from me and turn eastward and hide by the get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook of Cherith, which flows in the Jordan. And it shall, will be that you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. And so he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and stayed at the brook of Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. And then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, go to uh, uh, Zarpha, Zarphath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. And see, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. And so he rose and went to Zarphath. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed, the widow was there gathering sticks. And she called to him and said, Please bring me water in a cup that I might drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And so she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin, a little oil in a jar. And see, I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me. Afterwards, make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor the jar of oil run out until the Lord sends rain on the earth. And so she went away and did according to the word of Elijah, and he and her household ate for many days. And the bin of flour was not used up, nor the jar, dry, the jar of oil dry, according to the word of the Lord, which was spoken by Elijah. Now it happened after these things that the son of the woman who owed the house became sick. And his sickness was so serious that it was no breath left in him. And so she said to Elijah, What have I to do with you, O man of God? Have you come to bring me my sin and to my remembrance and to kill my son? And he said to her, Give me your son. So he took her out of his arms and carried her to the upper room where he was staying and laid him out on the bed. And then he cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, have you also brought this tragedy on this woman with whom I have lodged by killing her son? And he stretched himself out on the child three times and cried out to the Lord, O Lord my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. And then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came back to him, and he revived. Elijah took the child, brought him down from the upper room into the house, and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that you are the man of God, and that the word of the Lord is in your mouth. There are many games we have that people play that are thinking games, requires a, a little bit of thought process and, and focus. Um, some games we play are just games that are fun, just to goof off, to laugh. Um, I enjoy both. Uh, I am one who is very analytical. I like to think through processes of stuff, but also one who likes just to have fun and joke around and laugh up. And... My boys are learning different games, and uh, a couple of them they have been learning is checkers and chess and um, Mancala and uh, King's Corner. And all four of those are games where you got to have a thought process, kind of planning one move before the next move is done, and hoping that your opponent will make the move you think they're going to make so you can make your move exactly the way you want. And it's interesting watching Kylan because Kylan really thinks a lot and, and goes through the process. and. Um, he gets frustrated sometimes playing me in chess because he says, I should have beat you. <laughs> but he makes a move sometimes that he's not anticipating that gets him kind of caught. We have here a situation where God is working in the children of Israel's lives. And I don't want to make it seem uh, not important that, that what's happening here, because it is very important. But God is going to be doing things behind the scenes that not even Elijah understands the prophet of God. God's going to be making moves and placing Elijah in different positions to accomplish different things that God has in design. 
I don't know what's going in in all your lives. Some of you share with me sometimes things you're facing. Some of you kind of keep more to yourself. Each person is a little different. Or some people, they'll tell you everything and what they ate for breakfast in the morning and what they drank. <laughs> people are like that. And you have other people, I mean, they may be fa possibly facing a, a major situation where they may think they might not come out of it alive. They may not still share that. But God knows. He sees everything. He cares. He loves you. And I want us to look, as we look through this chapter 17, it's just a glimpse of, of Elijah's ministry. But it gives us a, a glimpse as God is building not just the faith of his prophet, but he's building the faith of those who are underneath him too. As bad as this virus has been, and how it's getting again, I want us to see that God's still in control. Amen. There's nothing that slips past him. As God brings plagues and diseases and famines and wars to the children of Israel, many times it's one to wake up their leadership. Other times it's to wake up the people themselves. And I, I was doing a little bit of research comparing what we're facing now to the Spanish flu that hit almost 100 years ago, a little over 100 years ago. Anybody know about how many people died from the Spanish flu? I mentioned a little bit of this on Wednesday night. The conservative number, the low number, is 40 million. The high number is roughly around 100 million. Nobody knows for sure. The world population was a whole lot less then than it is now. Anybody know where we're at right now with the people that have died from COVID? About almost 4.5 million. Again, I don't want to make light of this and say it's not, because every person who lost someone is important. But if, if that many people die from the Spanish flu and many people still have faith in God and trust in God and reliance on God to get them through, should we also have the same? We can learn from those who've gone through tragedies as bad as ours or worse. The Spanish flu, the wars that took place, the Depression, those people who lived around that time, they had a real tough time of it. And they had to really trust in God to get them through we do so too. We need to realize that God is working through. We don't know why this is happening. We may not know until we get to heaven. And then again, we may not even know. It may not be important because once we see Jesus, everything that seemed frivolous and not important is going to be gone. We're going to still see him and worship him. But Elijah, he, he, he is told as this prophet of God, he, he is, he, he's given a mission that, that most prophets probably wouldn't like to have. You're going to go and you're going to tell people that it's not going to rain until you say it's going to rain again. Think about that. This prophet is given the power by God that it's not going to rain until he says it's going to rain. Until God tells him to tell people. Now, we've been pretty dry around here. I didn't realize how dry it was until I got back because I had no access to hardly anything up there. Unless we go into town, which is a half hour drive from where we're staying at. As dry as the summer's been so far, think about if you went the whole summer and we had no rain. Oh, wow. Those of you farmers, you could tell me that that'd be a pretty bad situation, wouldn't it? Going the whole summer and no rain. Here we have Elijah going and he's saying, it's not going to rain. And it is about three years goes by before it rains. Can you imagine the devastation that would cause? The problems and struggles that people would face? We can just think back to last year how hard it was when it came everything started shutting down just to find certain things. I had never dreamed in my whole life that toilet paper would be something hard to find to buy. That would be a premium. Thank God we have it. Thank God we have it. Other things that, we, that none of us could have foreseen that would have been a major problem. But can you imagine going three years without anything being able to be grown? Three years without having water that you're able to access, without living by a major river like the Ohio to have access to water because wells dry up. I remember my grandparents, um, many dry summers. That my grandmother, I mean, she, she was tough sometimes. 
But yeah. she also had a reason to it. They had a little well. And whenever it got a few, a few weeks to a month without any rain, their well dried up. And that causes all kinds of problems, dealing with the pump and getting it started back up once the water comes in, being able to wash laundry, being able to cook. And so whenever we visited her, and it was uh, been a few weeks without any rain, she was very cautious about water. She would just jump onto us and say, don't let that water run like that. Like you may let it run a little bit when you're trying to brush your teeth. Nope. Get toothbrush wet, turn it off, brush your teeth, turn it back on, rinse your toothbrush off, turn it back off. That quick. Because she had to conserve the water. But think about how life would be for us if it was three years. How would your relationship with God be affected? for three years without water. Would that affect your relationship with God? I think most of us, we may have a hard time with that. We think, God, what's going on? Why are you allowing this to happen to me? Why are you picking on me? But Elijah, as he's going, he's going for a reason because the children of Israel have turned their backs on to God and they've turned their worship towards things of the world, the false idols, the Canaanite false gods. They've abandoned God and they've chased after these Canaanite false religions. And they have a very wicked king. He was a very wicked king, but you know what? As bad as he was as a king, his wife was worse. <laughs> Jezebel. She's a Gentile wife, which you probably shouldn't have been a part of being in the kingship. And, and, and what's interesting, the stories unfold close to where she's originally from. You think God has a plan in that? Zarphoth, where we'll learn about the widow here in a second, that's where she's originally from. That's her area where she grew up at. And she was a very evil woman. And so you have the leadership of this country, very evil, you have the people who are worshiping God and serving God. And as we, we know the verse where it says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and cry out to me and turn from their wicked ways, I will heal their land. That's to believers. Sometimes we face things in life just because of just sin in general. And I've mentioned this on um, Sunday evenings. We, we just finished studying about illness. Some things are just a result of the fall of Adam and Eve. This world is cursed. Some things we face in life is not specifically anything we have done wrong or someone close to us. It's just a part of what happened to this world when God cursed this world. Then there's other things that happen, and most of us, there are times we can think about it, that we have chose sinful decisions and things have happened to us because of that specifically. And we need to confess that and turn it to God. But here we have Elijah coming in and he's telling people, this is what God says, it will not rain. Now, you can imagine how many people want to hang him up right now. You can imagine how many people, whether there are pitchforks and so forth, going out to, as a mob to get him. We're going to make you say it's going to rain because we want some water for stuff to grow. And God knew that. So as Elijah tells Ahab and Jezebel and, and, and everyone else that, that it's not going to rain, he takes off. God protects him because he knows if he stays where he's at, he's going to get killed. And so he takes him to a, a, a little river. A little creek, really, is a brook, probably a creek like we have around here. And God says, you're going to stay there for a while until I tell you it's time to go somewhere else. Now, God is building Elijah's faith also through the process of this. Can you imagine him as he's everyone's upset with him? They're mad at him because he's the one who told them God's word. And God says, I'm going to take care of you through this process because I have a plan for you. I have a purpose for you. And he says, when you go to this brook where you're going to stay at, I'm going to feed you by the ravens. You know what? For a Jewish man, that would be hard to do because a raven was considered an unclean animal. Um, we have birds around here. I don't know for sure the, all these black birds, if they're considered ravens or not. I don't know. But ravens sometimes are scavengers. They eat whatever they find laying around. So we don't know what for sure the meat was <laughs> that these ravens brought to Elijah, but it probably... Who knows, if maybe it was a dead animal, or they caught something alive, I don't know. But he says, I'll have them bring you bread, and I'll have them bring you meat, and you'll eat that. And that'll sustain you, and you'll drink from the brook to make sure you don't dehydrate. 
And so God had a plan for Elijah, even though he was in a rock and a hard place, you can kind of say, as he's running, and later on he'll run for his life again, hiding out, but God has him in a place where he's going to work with Elijah and help him to grow and build his faith. So Elijah, as he's there at that brook, he's, he's eating this food that's brought by these unclean birds. He's drinking from the brook. And eventually what happens is the drought has gone so long that the brook itself dries up. That's rough when you have a creek or a small little river around you and it's always flowing water, but then one summer it just stops running. You know it's pretty bad. I've seen that certain times in West Virginia. But God says, okay, Elijah, uh, I'm done with you being in this place in your life and, and, and what I'm doing with you. I, I've taught you to trust in me to provide you food, provide you something to drink. Now I need you to trust me, Elijah. I need you to go to Jezebel's hometown, and I want you to find this Gentile woman, and she's going to take care of feeding you until I tell you it's time to move on again. So Elijah does. He takes off, and he travels, and he goes to this Gentile woman at, at Zarpha. And, and, and think with me, ladies, as you put yourself in this lady's shoes. Okay, her husband's dead. She's a widow. She's left to raise her son by herself. And she's at the process collecting the last little bit of dry firewood that she can find, sticks and limbs laying around to make a fire to fix the last little bit of food she has to feed her and her son, and then they're going to starve to death. Okay, think about that, being in this lady's shoes. And here Elijah shows up and he says to her, and, and, and your Bible probably has the word please in it. Most English translations have it to make it sound nice, but Elijah's commanding her. The Hebrew word here is a commandment. It's an imperative. You must go do this. Now think about this, ladies. How many of you would like your husband to say, you must go get me a drink of water and bring it to me now? Some of you would probably say, you're big enough, you got two hands, two feet, you go get it yourself. Right? If you're honest. Here's this guy showing up that has no relationship to her. He's not even from her city. He is a Jew, and the Jews and the Gentiles didn't get along very well. And he's telling her, you must go get me a cup of water. But she knew that he was a Jew. She also, in some way, knew that he was also a man of God. However, maybe because of the way he was dressed or because it was reported in the city, a, man, a Jewish man of God had come to town. I don't know. And she says, okay, I'll go get you some water to drink. Remember, water is limited right now. Many wells have probably dried up. But she is willing to go get him some water to bring to him to drink because he commanded it. Oh, by the way, while you get my water for me, I, I see you getting ready to fix something to eat. Um, you must feed me. <laughs> Many you ladies probably have your husbands asking, uh, what time's dinner? My wife gets sometimes frustrated with me because usually about 5 o'clock I'm asking what time is dinner, what we're eating for dinner. Because that's kind of what we grew up. We usually ate between 5 and 6 about every day growing up. And he says, you must feed me what you have. And then, after you feed me, then you can feed yourself and your son. Ladies, how would you handle that? <laughs> you probably uh, let, let, let go of a little bit of your spirituality and tell them off. Right? And she says, all I have is this little bit that's left. All I have is just a tiny bit of flour, a tiny bit of cruise of oil. I'm gathering whatever sticks I can find. I'm going to make a fire. I'm going to fix a, a little loaf of uh, a bread, probably more like a biscuit. And, and I'm going to split that with my son. The two of us are going to eat that. And then I, I guess we're going to starve that because there's nothing else left after that. There's no more food. And Elijah tells her, God has told me that if you take care of me, that you will not starve. That flour will last until it rains again. That jar of oil will last a little bit you have until it rains again. If you only have faith. <clears throat> so we see Elijah's faith here is trusting God first to provide him at the brook. Now he's trusting God to allow some woman who does not know who he is, a foreign woman, even though he's the foreigner, she's a Gentile, 
to provide him something to eat in the land of Jezebel at that, the place where it would be considered a very wicked place to go. And he has to trust God's going to take care of him. We find ourselves many times in places where we just have to say, God, i got to just trust in you. I don't know what to do. I have no place to go. I know where, no body to turn to. I, I just got to seek you, God, to help me. And many times God comes through. But there are occasions where somebody who is a believer still starves to death. It happens in different parts of the world. Does that mean God doesn't care about them? Mm-mm. No, he still loves them just the same as he loves you. Sometimes God allows it to rain on the just and the unjust alike. Sometimes he allows the sunshine to come on the just and the unjust alike. Just because we're saved doesn't mean that God's going to make things easier for us. So often, a lot of times we think that should be the case, right? We even tell somebody, if you're going through problems and struggles, just turn over the Lord and things will work out all right. But that's not always the case. Jesus said, if you follow me, you obey Obey my teachings, what God the Father has taught me to tell you. If you obey that, life's going to get harder for you. They hate me, they will hate you. They curse me, they will curse you. They kill me, they will kill you. Now that's not something I want to sign up for. But as believers, that's truly what we're signing up for. Realize that we are being part of Jesus Christ. And so as, as Elijah is trusting this woman. He goes and stays with her. They eat, and, and, and she keeps making biscuits, and, and they keep getting water from someplace, and, and, and they're doing well. And then all of a sudden it says, and then it happened. Whenever you read that, usually in your English Bible, it should alert you that, 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 that it wasn't accidental what's about ready to take place next. Sometimes we read that and we think it's an accidental. No, then it happened, or it came upon, or this was the situation. Here we're told specifically as that takes place that God had a purpose and a plan and he wanted to increase Elijah's faith and he wanted to increase the faith of this woman. So this son who was spared from dying of starvation dies of some sickness, illness, disease. We don't know for sure what it is. It says that, that he was having trouble breathing so he may have some kind of virus. We don't know. And then all of a sudden the breath left him. And we're told specifically that he was dead. Now, think about if you were this widow who, who, who's u- using all that she has to take care of this man of God and, and brings him into her home, provides him a place to stay, provides him food to eat, taking care of him, and there God strikes down her son. You know what? That would make us put us in a place where we'd be a little upset with God, I think. Some of you may know someone or have experience where someone's lost a child. That's a very difficult situation, uh, as I know with my brother, the loss of my nephew. You can either get really bitter at God and mad at God and angry at God, or you can turn it over to God and say, God, I just got to trust you. I don't know why this happened. I don't know what the purpose was. But I know that you love me. I know that you have a plan. I know you're in control. I pray that you help me to grow in my faith. And so this woman goes to Elijah and says, Why have you come and done this to me? Would it not have been better? And it seemed like she almost kind of forgot that her son was about to starve to death before Elijah came on the scene. Isn't that how it is? Sometimes we forget about how God has worked in our life in the past when we're going through something in the present. And God wants to use that to help build our faith as we're facing something in the present. And she says, why have you come and and brought this disgrace upon me? Why have you come and brought this great pain upon me? If you had not come, my son would still be alive. Is that true? No. He would have died of starvation if it wasn't for Elijah. My son is dead. Is it because of my sin that I have committed? If so, let me know. I'll confess it or make it right. Please tell me what the problem is. Elijah, it's interesting here. Elijah wasn't alerted by God what was about to happen. He knew that it wasn't going to rain for several years. He knew that God was going to provide him at the brook. He knew God was going to take care of him and provide him from this widow. He did not know that this widow's son was going to die. He's left out of the picture. But he still has faith in God. 
He still believes that God has a purpose or a plan in whatever he's facing and what this widow is facing. And so he takes that son, that child, and takes it to his room and he breathes on that child and lays on the child to try to see it, what's going on and praying and begging God and pleading to God. There are times God does specifically answer prayer requests we have. Sometimes it is a yes, sometimes it's a no, and sometimes it maybe you have to wait a little while. In this case, it was a yes. But I know of other people who have prayed for their kids who are really sick, or a parent, a sister, or a brother, and, and, and they don't get healed. And they're asking, why is that the case? When such and such prayed and their family was healed, God, what, what, that's not fair. Don't we feel that way sometimes? When God seems to answer someone else's prayer request, but He doesn't acknowledge ours. We've got to remember that God is God. Amen. And every moment we have on this earth is a gift from Him. At any moment, every one of us can stop breathing. He didn't even have to speak it, but most of the time it says He speaks and it's done. But He didn't have to speak it. Our life could be wiped out just like that, like a vapor, be gone. But here, God answers yes to Elijah. Elijah, again, was not told why. Elijah did not know for sure if God was going to bring this boy back to life, but he believed, he had faith in God, he had trust in God, and we have a great outcome. Again, that's not always the case for all of us. But this was the case here. God wanted to build Elijah's faith, because Elijah got some trials that are going to come up. It's going to be a whole lot more difficult. And this widow has got a long way still to go. And so he's wanting them to grow in their faith. And so Elijah prays, and after pleading with God, begging God, crying out to God, God answers Elijah's prayer, and the boy comes back to life. He brings the boy down to the mom and says, here's your child. It's interesting. I can almost picture this woman kind of being like uh, Doubting Thomas in the New Testament. Remember Thomas, as, as Jesus comes to... To the disciples, the first time he appeared, it was just the ten of them, and and and, uh, and Thomas wasn't there. And he said, "Unless I see you with my eyes and touch with my hands that Jesus Christ is alive, I will not believe." This widow says, "Because I saw what God could do through you, since I saw the power of God as He healed my son, I'm a believer now." Thomas said the same thing. He says. When he sees the Lord, he says, I, I, I see and I believe. And Jesus said, it's greater for those who do not see and believe anyways. Maybe you're here this morning and you are going through some major difficulties and struggles and you wonder where God's at in the process. Well, he's still in control. Amen. He still loves you the same as he did yesterday, a year ago, ten years ago. Nothing's changed with God. He has a plan and purpose, and we don't understand even what's going on with this virus. We have no idea how worse it's going to get, but I do know the God who's over it. Amen. I do know the God who will one day, even if I die from this virus, that I'm going to go to heaven to be with Him. Because I know Jesus Christ is my Savior. If you're here today and your life seems like it's falling apart, especially as a believer, please let me know. I'll sit down and talk with you. We can pray together. It doesn't mean that the answer will be yes. The answer may be no. The answer may be, you need to wait a little while. I want you to pray a little bit more. I want you to grow in your faith a little bit more before I give you an answer for sure. If you're here this morning and you're lost, it means that you have never asked Jesus Christ to save you. You never have trusted in His death, burial, and resurrection. You need to believe that He was the Son of God. He is the second part of the Godhead. He is all God and all man at the same time. He had to be that be the perfect sacrifice. He died on the cross for all of our sins. And anyone who puts their faith and trust and believe that he died on the cross, that he was buried, and that he rose again, Paul tells us that's the gospel. And you confess your sins, ask him to forgive you. The Bible promises that he will take you to heaven when you die. If you have never done that, let today be that day that you do so. Let today be the day you trust in Jesus Christ to save you. And the great thing today, as we get ready to have here later, uh, as God provided for Elijah, John and the, the tag team ladies and everyone else who helped out has provided food for us today. And may the pot not dry up, and may the corn not disappear until everyone's belly's full. Let's close in prayer. Father, Lord, I pray that you just help us to have faith in you as we face trials and struggles, Lord. 
as we face the unknown of what's going to happen with this virus in our country, Lord, and as it's affecting other parts of the world a whole lot worse than it is affecting us here, Father. I pray, Lord, you help us learn, Father, to trust in you, to have faith that you're still in control and that you will guide and direct us. And, Lord, help us to realize that you're still the same God when sometimes you tell us no when we have prayer requests. But help us, Lord, also get some yeses to increase our faith as Elisha got and this widow got, Father, that we would grow in our faith and our walk and our relationship with you. Lord, we pray if there's one here that's lost that does not know Christ as their Savior, they have never trusted in his death, burial, and resurrection to forgive their sins, that today they would do that. They would not leave here without asking someone, how can they be saved? We pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.